Hey, everybody, and welcome to our podcast, Are You Aware? An enlightened podcast for the socially aware. I'm here with Dr. Dean Gray, Angel Prater, and my name is Fawn Preston, and we are excited to bring our first podcast to all of you. Um, if you are on your way home from work and you came across this podcast, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Hi, ladies. Hey. Hi, good How's afternoon. it going? Good, good. How are you? So good. How was your New Year's? Mm. I went to a... Um, Masquerade. Ooh, yeah, love it. it was pretty Fun. cool. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. How about you, Christine? How's it going? Um, yes, it's going well. Happy to be here. Really, I'm um, excited to be working with you guys on this project, and um, yeah, ready to dive in. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. me too. I'm excited. We are to talk about aware. So, um, I'm gonna forward that over to Angel because Angel talks about aware better than anybody I know. Well, actually, I think we do the <laughs> intro. So, if you'd like to, um do some connection. That'd be great. Oh, yeah. yes. Take a moment to totally. connect and reflect. Yeah. Totally. Um, Let's do it. <clears throat> well, I had put some thought into this yesterday. And um, a few weeks ago, um, an educator and mentor who was very special to me, not somebody I knew personally, but somebody I had studied, um, she uh, passed away, made her final transition. And um, her name was Bell Hooks. And... Uh, she talked about something often and for a very long time uh, that I think is very central to the kind of work that we are doing. Um, and one of her ideas uh, that was kind of a theme throughout her her work um, and her um, she authored 30 books, probably about 30 books um, on culture and um, love. Um, with respect to love, she always used to say that love is not just a feeling, but it's an action word. It's an action word and it's a call to action. Um, and it's one of the ways that we are able to, uh, demonstrate our commitment to certain ideas and, um, people. And I think when it comes to the populations that we work with a lot, the very vulnerable mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and people who may or may be on the fringe, mm -hmm. um, I think it's I think it's something that I think about a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. very I appreciate you sharing that meaningful, mm -hmm. meaningful um, idea to think of love as a practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, not just a. Walt Disney romance. Not just a feeling. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Totally. I've always thought about um, <clears throat> being in love, not um, a feeling at all, um, but a combination uh, and collection of feelings that come from actions mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. others have given me, like time and attention or... Um, you know, uh, feeling respected, feeling mm -hmm. honored, feeling heard, all of the things that then make me feel in love mm -hmm. with the individual or people around me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Very true. Very wholesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, and I think that love gets, uh, you know, misconstrued sometimes and people, you know, automatically associate it with like romance or, mm -hmm. you know, loving a child. And I think that you can love a total stranger. Mm -hmm. You know, you can through that action, you know, whether it's just stopping and having a conversation with somebody and like offering a piece of gum, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's having a connection with somebody and having somebody be seen and felt heard, mm -hmm. um, and acknowledged, yeah. you know? So yeah, I definitely think it's an action word. Mm -hmm. I saw this meme recently that said, um, um, normalize telling your friends and strangers that you love them. And I absolutely I love, that. love that because for decades I will be in my work or in just random strangers and, and tell people like, I love you and the look on their faces. And, and it's just always spoke to me that like, we don't tell people we love them enough. Um, we're so put off by the way society has, you know, kind of demonized that word that I think it's really important that we can just be, do you boo, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like be who you are and be willing to express love um, and show and demonstrate that love is is um, something that can be very organic and unconditional in lots of different ways. Yeah. So it's yeah. a great intro. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah, I love that. 
Mm-hmm. I'm going to be looking her up now and going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Well, so um, let's talk about AWARE a little bit and why we're here today <laughs> and what um, our plans are for this podcast period. Yeah, absolutely. So what is AWARE? AWARE stands for Advocacy, Wellness, Action, Recovery, and Education. And so when we think about AWARE, we want to we like encompass all of these um, words into bringing advocacy to the world, bringing wellness um, to, to communities, individuals in the world. Um, action, that's, you know, um, whoops, Advocacy, wellness, action, that means doing stuff, doing things intentionally different. Um, Recovery, and what does that really mean to us? Um, Recovery being... um, you are in recovery when you say you are, and and, and there's no limitations. Um, Recovery from drugs um, or mental health or recovery from whatever. I mean, you get to define it. Individuals get to define it. So we like to think about the recovery aspect as not linear, just really honoring whatever pathway people choose. And then education. Um, Education encompassing all walks of life, um, all roles, behavioral health, physical health, corporation, um, education. So we bring all of these things kind of... um, across the board to our society. And that's, that's our focus. And then how we're doing that is um, we have training and technical assistance. So that's one arm of the three arms of what we do. The training and technical assistance is pretty live or in person or, or via Zoom remote. We're in this world, right? Um, and then the second arm is very specific to an online institute that we're in the, in the process of building so that for those who cannot attend in person or live events um, or leave work for, you know, long periods of time, they'll be able to, you know, take our trainings, um, get some coaching, et cetera, um, on an online on demand kind of membership kind of way, um, on their own time. And then the third arm, we're not quite there yet, but we're going there as, um, there's so many amazing individuals and small businesses, nonprofits and others who are doing amazing work and we really value and um, believe in collaboration and lifting people up. And what we've been able to see across the, across the board over the multiple decades each that we've worked in our systems is there's a lot of competition, competition for funding, competition for, you know, um, um, building relationships. And what happens is you get some that are kind of in this popularity group. Um, And then they streamline a lot of um, funding to one or two or just a few organizations when there's a lot of smaller groups that don't have the capacity to apply for funding with, you know, professional grant writers and things like that. And so we want to bridge and bring a foundation that will um, be able to help fund a lot of people who um, can't compete with these larger organizations that um, tend to dominate the funding streams. And so um, our primary focus is really around trauma awareness, and, um, and we'll go into detail more about what that means. And anyone that um, wants support in bridging or building their um, the, their expertise um, to bring it to where it's really trauma aware and not just using a lot of buzzwords that um, might um, get them, you know, in the door, but to really embed it in what they're teaching or offering, that's what we're really trying to support is um, bringing awareness of trauma awareness to all systems and companies. Yeah. I think that's in a nutshell. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. Anything to add ladies? Did I miss? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's so much, you know, within that, you know, the education piece of that, um, you know, just spreading trauma awareness, you know, within these systems is so huge because, um, I've worked in those systems. We've all worked in those systems and we see where those systems fail when trauma awareness isn't embedded in everything from, you know, policies and procedures, you know, to hiring processes, to supervision, you know, for your workforces um, and elsewhere. So, yeah, I appreciate it. It's it's important. How about you, Christine? Um, I really like that you were focused um, or that you brought attention to the idea of collaboration Mm. 
and um, trying to incorporate as many different perspectives as we can mm -hmm. um, to better meet, meet the needs of the people that we're serving. Mm -hmm. um, because I think what we're finding over and over again is um, that the one, the, the singular approach that we've taken all these years um, has really uh, not served us well. It excludes a lot of um, people and a lot of ideas. And um, if there isn't acceptance and the mutual respect that mm -hmm. we know is necessary in order to develop um, relationships um, and uh, have productive um, work environments, then, um, yes, I, th I think it, it really... Um, can be quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and talented people burn out. Yeah, they you do. know. Yeah. Nobody comes into <laughs> right. uh, you know being a first responder or you know working in healthcare to get loaded. You know, they right. come into it because they've got that fire in the belly. They want to yeah. help people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it all comes from a really good place, and then they get burnt out. Yeah. You yeah. know, and we lose talented folks because of it to other positions yeah. outside right. the system. So. And that's the action. For me, that's really around the action piece, right? Like looking at the micro, meso, and macro systems, you know, and the people doing the frontline work, and then the people who are administrating kind of that work, and then the system globally, or even, you know, across the US, obviously, but, but even globally, um, when we think about who's driving the system, and what is driving the system, people like ourselves coming into this line of work, really because we have that fire in our belly and we want to do great work and we want to help people. Well, you know what? There's many of us out there doing that mm -hmm. and, and we're so burnt out um, and people are leaving the workforce. Why? Because they're not being taken care of. And why is it that we have people working and doing this beautiful heart work and the agency or the company is not protecting their wellness, the way we are expected to protect the people we serve. Mm -hmm. Everyone's vulnerable. And, and we just need to call that out. And that's the action piece for me is really just um, systems change. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exciting, mm -hmm. exciting opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to go over our mission and um, vision, Christine? Um, sure. Sure. Um, so um, Aware Consulting Group. And uh, our mission statement is, uh, of course, first, do no harm. Mm -hmm. yep. Do no harm. And our vision is to create a culture of universal trauma awareness. We recognize the prevalence of trauma and the intersectionality of trauma, mental wellness, and substance use. Our mission is to implement strategies for workforce development that are aligned with the trauma-aware protocols and that are known to foster health, safety, and respect for clients and staff alike. We believe that trauma awareness will foster authentic participation in the markets for goods and services for individuals and communities so that we are better positioned to hear and to validate each other's experiences mutually determine the needs to be met, and promote wellness. And by doing so, that we can improve health outcomes across the board. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Absolutely. And I think a little addition there is, um, you know, for our audience is um, to know that we're not just focusing on behavioral health or physical health organizations. You know, we're working with corporations, um, with staff wellness initiatives. We're working with um, um, general population, families. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're bringing um, everything that we do um, and customizing it and tailoring it to who we're interacting with, who needs right. the support. And mm -hmm. I yeah. love that corporations are really taking note now, yeah. you know, um, like PGE, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. taking note that, oh, you know, all of the their customer service representatives are being traumatized um, and their, their customers are having trauma and it's, and it's all, you know, 
interconnected yeah. and how can they <clears throat> how can corporations bring that awareness to their companies to overall um, create that safety and wellness mm -hmm. um, for everyone involved. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will yeah. take a trauma-informed and a trauma-aware workforce mm -hmm. across all industries. Absolutely. Because trauma does not discriminate. Right. Nope. Everybody mm -hmm. is touched by it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially right now, mm -hmm. right? You know, we just went through this, you know, couple of years of COVID and, you know, people being home and, um, you know, everybody's kind of dealing with some mental health stuff. Those people mm -hmm. that weren't dealing with it two years ago are dealing with it now. Right. Um, you know, even as far as, you know, people just not wanting co to come back to work because who wants to tackle Portland traffic? Everybody's right. realizing, yeah, that was yeah. really, really stressful yeah. and it really affected my day mm -hmm. because now that they're at home and working from home, you know, they're not having to pay for daycare, mm -hmm. you know, they're not having to fight the traffic, you know, all of these things. Um, and so, yeah, that's one of the, you know, beautiful things I think about what we're doing is that we're not just focusing on behavioral health, you know, we're, we're really putting it out there to everybody. Um, and I love the fact that corporations are recognizing that their folks really need more wellness initiatives, mm -hmm. um, you know, to keep them fulfilled at their job, you mm -hmm. know, and, yeah. and wanting to continue to come into work every day. Um, and, you know, it's super important just for, you know, our suicide outcomes, you know, we know that those are high and mm -hmm. that people are struggling. And so every single thing that we produce is something that is going to go out into the system and promote trauma awareness and mental wellness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in those systems. Mm -hmm. So... I'm proud of what we're doing, girls. Yes, it's very exciting. Yeah. And there does seem Teamwork to be makes yeah. the dream. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> they, these have to go. So these two hands. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, do what? it. Oh, oh, uh -huh. no, there you uh -huh. go. I see <laughs> Teamwork ladies. makes the dream work. <laughs> now we know. Yeah. You can Perfect. read my mind. Yes. <laughs> so I fun. <laughs> Why don't you describe the origins of trauma awareness or yeah, uh, of aware? Of aware. Yeah. yeah. Um, so back in uh, 2011, I uh, was really fortunate to take a training that um, the funders of our program paid for. And it was like a pretty expensive training. It was done by like a national leader in you know trauma-informed care. It was the first time I'd ever heard of trauma-informed care. And um, you know, it was two days, eight hour days. And I struggle sometimes in, you know, some of these trainings. Um, I have ADD and I am a neurodiverse individual. And so, you know, I'm clicking a pen under the table or refilling my coffee, you know, 20 times um, during a training. And so I really, really struggled with being able to intake, you know, all of this information and ingest it because it was really, really data heavy. Um, you know, it, it was really important. Like it was very obvious that it was really important for us to deliver services in a, you know, quote unquote trauma informed way. Um, but I left there and I felt frustrated with myself, frustrated with my ability to learn, um, as well as frustrated with my ability to take that information back to my staff. Um, and, you know, properly convey that information to them. Um, so, you know, I did my own research. I, everything that I learned was a really good starting point to be able to go down a Google rabbit hole <laughs> um, and really learn more, you know, and I spent a lot of time on SAMHSA's web website, you know, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And um, through that process, I really realized that, A, um, you know, trauma-informed care is important if it's said in a way that people get it, because then they get it, um, as well as a huge part of that is what happens within us, you know, when something traumatic is happening, when a person needs support, um, you know, our brain has a normal function to protect ourselves from trauma. And when we are activated, um, you know, we're going to respond in a certain way. We're not, we might not necessarily respond in a trauma informed way because we're going through trauma, you know, ourselves. Um, so yeah, so I started kind of doing some little trainings here and there. I trained all my staff and they, um, they got it. And so I was excited about that and, uh, they went out there and they were awesome. And so people were asking all the time, like, Hey, who trained these guys? And I'm like, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, 
And so just from that point forward, you know, it was really like, okay, we really need to embed trauma awareness into these systems because the more I worked, you know, when I was running that, um, that drop-in center in Michigan, you know, I was the boss. So things were a certain way, but then I would go out and I'd venture into these different systems and these different providers and just be like, ah, oh my goodness, like this is, you know, so stressful you know, um, trying to support a person. And then we're waiting for four hours in a lobby and they've already mixed their name up twice and, you know, said something, you know, to somebody else to where their HIPAA was being violated, like all these uh, assaults, you know, it seemed like all the time. Um, and so it just really put me in a space of like, A, something needs to be done. B, it needs to be done in a way that people understand people like me, people who struggle you know, with traditional learning styles um, and see it needs to be widespread. Like it needs to be a big deal because, you know, kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, I think I, it is interesting how just it seems now that there is starting to be a groundswell of support mm -hmm. for this kind of absolutely this kind of um kind of sea change mm -hmm. in our approach to um engaging people with um a history of trauma um yeah. in the world of goods and services and industry um yeah. so it's very exciting to mm -hmm. uh to be a part of it um yeah and it, mm -hmm. it's it's been a long time coming yeah. It's been a long time coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, just through my research, I was really surprised to find out that actually trauma-informed care, quote unquote, has been around since like the 70s. Yeah. Um, you know, mostly medical systems, you know, predominantly. Mm -hmm. And so to work within systems that are super not trauma-informed, mm -hmm. it just seemed so weird. Like, yeah you know, A, why hasn't this been a bigger deal? You know, why haven't we been pushing this farther? But honestly, I really believe that they are pushing it, but they're pushing it in a way that it's like, okay, we want to be trauma-informed and trauma-informed is the what and the why. Right. Um, and trauma-aware is the how. Right. How do we do this? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know? So, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk more about that, Angel? Just the trauma difference between trauma-informed care and trauma-aware care? Yeah, definitely. So the way I've um, processed what that means, you know, being somebody who's been teaching on trauma and suicide and self-harm and, and beyond in relationships for decades, what I've um, noticed with these buzzwords of trauma-informed care across, you know, working in the system, I noticed that that is the what and the why and the what it is and why it's important. And what we lack in our system and in our general population is the internal process of being aware of our own traumas so that we can have an external practice. So it's an internal process for an external practice. Um, that's what trauma awareness means to me and, um, and what we're trying to incorporate in aware and in our teaching is to help people recognize that, yes, this data is important. Yes, it's important to know what it is and why it's important. And it's just equally, if not a little more important to be aware of how you're interacting with individuals. And what I've been seeing is people aren't teaching people the how. So of course we are teaching people how, mm -hmm. and, and um, not just how to be external, but how to be processing internally and being self-aware of our part in all these engagements and our own traumas. So when we think about the first responders or the police officers or, you know, a clinical practitioner or peer support or mentor or even a family member, you know, if we're not going inward to recognize our own parts and to recognize maybe when I'm being activated from my own traumas that I might not even be aware of, then I'm not able to respond to the individuals I'm working with, I'm more reactive. And so um, that's what's happening a lot in our system across the board is people aren't being taught to go inward. They're yeah. taught to focus externally. And so for me, that's kind of where I, I like to kind of really drive it home is like, yes, and right, not but it's a, they're both extremely important. Um, and we need to be teaching people how 
Mm-hmm. How to be aware, how to be responsive rather than reactive, how to be responsive and compassionate to themselves, um, how to heal their own stuff internally. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that they have traumas um, that, um, you know, drive home kind of what they're doing in all of aspects of their lives. And so um, sometimes it's harmful to their, you know, quality of life. And sometimes it's what's keeping them alive at that time. And and so there's no shame around it, just honoring that what is and being willing to go inward to explore so that you can be responsive. Mm-hmm. Do you want to add to that? I'm hearing a radical self-acceptance. Yeah. Yes, and I do love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With no shame and no judgment. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, guilt um, is I did something wrong. I love to say this. Um, shame is I am something wrong and it kind of takes a life of its own. And so if we can help people recognize like, okay, I might've done something wrong, whoever's definition of wrong is right. Um, if people kind of blend into like, hold on to that guilt so immensely over time, it becomes shame or it can instantly feel shameful Mm -hmm. depending on our perspectives or our worldviews or our upbringing or whatever. And if we can help people recognize that, um, we don't have to be ashamed of anything. We could say the F word if we want to, yeah. and it doesn't freaking matter. And we will. Right? And we will, some saying, so we will be saying shit damn fuck, <laughs> stay, right? Stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned yeah. for more. Um, but whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that we uh, we encounter and we've done ourselves, or we see people that um, really live with a lot of shame. And it's heartbreaking because it's usually induced um, by trauma or comes out the next sideways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just a failure to support, a yeah. failure to find supports at the appropriate mm-hmm. time. Yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah. people are so judgmental. Yeah. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. you're not doing it this way, therefore you don't want it, therefore you can't receive our support. Right. And that's conditional and it's mm-hmm. coercive and it's punitive and we want to rid of all of that because that, that induces shame. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I think we will have our work cut out for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mm-hmm. agree. Do we want to have each of us introduce ourselves, what, who we are and why we're here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe? That totally. That sounds great. You want to start? Mm-hmm. Sure. I'll okay. start. I'll start. Well, um, I'm Dr. Dean Gray, and uh, I came to this work um, some time ago when I first started in the mental health uh, services industry in um, a little village called Fiji in Ghana where um, we were trying to reframe the, in a, I worked in a little clinic um, that was a daycare center for mentally ill adults, and we were trying to reframe their experiences of mental illness in a society that has very, very rigid parameters for what's socially acceptable and what's not, and what your role is going to be in family and um you know, who you're going to marry, things were really quite structured um, for people in this culture in particular. And um, so it was a matter of trying to help the people in the village uh, receive these family members back after they had had certain treatments for their um, mental health. And um, they were going to be uh, rehomed in their families. And so it was about, um, education and teaching about, um, mental health and wellness, um, in a society that really didn't have a lot of, uh, even language for that, um, for those processes. Um, the language we were using was Fonti. I didn't speak Fonti much, but, um, we had translators. (laughs) Um, And that brings me to, so those kinds of experiences ultimately brought me to the work I'm doing today in um, family and addiction medicine practice, where um, I think we're still struggling with a lot of the same issues in spite of having the words and having the language and knowing the data. Um, I think Part of the challenge is just the structure of the work and the pay for performance nature of work in the healthcare system. Um, But I think there is still um, just a lack of acceptance um, and 
um, a lot of shame, I think, for people who have somehow learned um, behavior that is not well suited to their their goals and their lifestyle. Um, so when I met Fawn um, and Angel and heard that you all were actually turning the world on its head by <laughs> I love you <laughs> by by um, examining these um, these practices that we have um, that are not mindful of the experience and that people are bringing to the table and not respectful of the um, experiences that people are bringing to the table um, it just struck me that there really is no other way to engage people in a way that's productive and efficient and allows, um, you know, for safe exchanges of information and delivery of services and a path towards wellness. I mean, it doesn't really matter what the industry is, as you were saying earlier, Angel. Um, it's across the board mm -hmm. um, that we struggle to... Um, show love and respect, um, and create community yeah. in a kind of mindful and meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I love the idea of radical acceptance, yeah. Oh yeah, you know, and I just, I love the idea of, you know, people just loving the fact that others are unique and loving them for that. Mm -hmm. Um, when I moved here six years ago mm -hmm. and saw the big O sign, keep Portland weird. I was like, yes, Portland. <laughs> I love you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, you know, speaks to me a hundred percent. Just that radical acceptance. We're allowed to be whoever we want to be and are more awesome because we are right. all different mm -hmm. and unique. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. The only normal people are the ones you don't know very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not I. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I get emotional thinking about what you just said about, um, you know, wellness for all, right. you like, um, and that emotion comes from, you know, I think about, um, I'm a grandma now, right? And and when I think about, like, for instance, you know, traditional education systems, right? Um, growing up, I'm 50 years old, growing up um, with dyslexia and ADHD. And, you know, my mom was a really hard worker and wasn't home a lot. And so I was a latchkey kid. And um, why are we... Why are we not teaching um, wellness within our, and um, it makes me just emotional and it makes sad to think about like um, if we wanted to design a system to keep people sick, we would design something like what we have, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to get them more sick. And so when I think about um, my emotions came up and what I felt emotional because, you know, I have now four grand. Uh, three grandbabies and <clears throat> four soon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, and with that, um, you know, I think about their future and the importance of, um, incorporating wellness across their, their whole life. And, and, um, you know, being somebody who's neurodivergent, being somebody who, um, failed through the educational system, you know, a little bit of my, my, um, intro is really around, you know, being a latchkey kid. And the first time I used drugs, I was, you know, smoke pot. I was six years old, like, um, not because <clears throat> my mother wasn't a good mother, but because I was a latchkey kid and I, I found relationships out in the community and, and those just happened to be kids that were using and, and, um, and then regularly at eight years old. And then, um, the local drug dealer at 10, 10 years old was giving me LSD, you know, and, and I was this guinea pig. And so when I think about like, fortunately I was able to kind of persevere and, you know, go get through that, that lifestyle, um, and, and leaving home at 16 and then, and finally found wellness or recovery at 24 years old. But, you know, that was nine States later, countless cities, you know, and from park benches to penthouses is kind of where I live. And I think about how many other people are having to go through that, um, and how many other children will have that pathway, um, because they didn't fit in a box because they, um, you know, I couldn't hardly read and when I was 24 years old. So, you know, I had an eighth grade education, like my success rate 
to um, those who were my teachers back in junior high, elementary and high school, you know, oh, she's just another one of those kids, right? The troublemakers. And the reality was, is I had a learning style that didn't fit in their box. And so therefore I felt shame every time they shake their head at me. Like I remember Mrs. Sparks in third grade doing that to me because I, you know, always got F's. Well, so I think about how are we teaching our, our kids in society today, right? That's what brings me here. You know, being in behavioral health since I got into recovery and creating programs for people who were houseless and on drugs and trying to get out of that lifestyle, what we needed, what we needed and need are um, pathways for people to be able to do that and honor whatever their pathway looks like and to let them drive that with s- some assistance. That's why I'm here. That's why I do what I do. You know, having just recently a year ago leaving um, an executive director role, part of that uh, decision was because I was just kind kind of conforming um, to the way it is, right? And sure, we had a multi-million dollar um, budget. That being said, um, we had all these rigid things that we had to be doing that didn't allow us to do the things that I felt we needed for our staff Mm -hmm. and we needed for the people we served. Mm -hmm. And, um, And that wasn't by any fault of the people who wrote the contracts or anything. It's just the way our system is. And um, everybody came with their heart um, and soul into the work. And I just, I got burned out. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I'm doing 90% of what I hate to do. And that's administrative work. When I'm a creative person, I want to build programs. I want to analyze systems. I want to build relationships and, Mm -hmm. you know, and and change, let's heal the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And so... So for me, that's kind of why I'm here um, and why I do what I do um, and why I'm excited to be partnered with you both because um, we get to do, we get to build something that's going to outlive us and we get to do us. Mm -hmm. We don't have to conform to what others want us to do. We just get to do some shit that's going to make a big difference um, Mm -hmm. and bridge some gaps. Absolutely. And yep. heal some systems and people, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. What about you, love? Yeah. You know, um, I mean, you guys know, but, you know, I'm a person who has a lot of trauma. You know, I had a pretty traumatic childhood. Um, you know, my parents were um, addicted to heroin. And so all that that entails, you know, just being moved around a lot um, to, you know, all the traumas that we don't talk about you know, um, in public. Um, and my dad did 27 years in prison, you know? And so, um, I'm a person who has used these systems, you know, I'm a person who, um, I've got my own criminal justice background, um, because I was a kid, you know, from tough stuff and did all my own tough stuff. So I, I traumatized myself and, um, you know, was traumatized, but then further traumatized in systems that are not, um, created, you know, to uh, be conducive to somebody like me who um, doesn't trust going in. Um, you know, I think I probably lied through every single appointment I had, you know, in the beginning, you know, they'd ask me how much I used. I lied, Friend. <laughs> you know, um, they asked me where I lived. I lied, you know, um, I pretty much, you know, lied about everything because, you know, of the judgment, you know, you worry about judgment and, you know, you worry about, you know, getting assessed at mm-hmm. some level, you know, that's going to stick to you for the rest of your life. Um, and I think I even at, you know, one point really just stopped telling providers anything like that, you know, um, you know, they would ask if I had, you know, drug history and I'm like, nope, mm-hmm. I sure don't, you know, because I didn't like the way I was talked to, the way I was looked at, um, you know, questioned, you know, I, w- I would come in and, you know, be sick as hell and be like, can I please get something for this cough? And they're like, hey, hey not what you want, yeah. you know, and I just yeah. I just got so sick of, you know, being treated, you know, like a person who always had an agenda, you know, being mistreated um, and mistreated, mistreated. totally plainly mistreated. Mm-hmm. And I think, I, you know, had I got the kind of help that I needed when I needed it, mm-hmm. not later after I had done my own healing and, you know, figured some things out on my own, 
I might be in a very different place today. And I don't have any, you know, quorums about where I'm at, you know, right now, because that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, I, you know, I'm so excited, you know, mm-hmm. that we're doing the work that we're doing right now. Um, but, you know, to think back like 17 years old, fresh out of jail, um, you know, I, I did eight and a half months in jail, pregnant with my daughter. And when I got out, you know, I delivered this baby, um, you know, in a room with people that I didn't really even know, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm like looking at this baby and going, okay, fun. Like, are you going to do to this baby what's been done to you, mm-hmm. you know, or are you going to do something different? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, right then I just decided like I was going to, I knew what not to do. Mm-hmm. I didn't really know what, <laughs> what to do, <laughs> but I knew yeah. what not to do. Um, and so I started with that. Okay, yeah. don't do these things and maybe add some things, you know, that are nice right. in the mix. Just um, kind of massage it a little bit. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> <laughs> massage the things, you Just know. massage the things. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been on this like 24-year healing journey. You know, my daughter's 24 years old. Um, and I was never perfect. I'm still not perfect. I'm still figuring it out. I still have rough days. Um, I still do a Tasmanian devil every now and again and lose my mind and (laughs) and then cry later because I lost my mind. Um, But I just, I really feel like I have been so fortunate to to weave in and out of this path of what my personal wellness looks like. And, you know, sometimes I mess it up and sometimes I do great and mm-hmm. I pat myself on the back and I'm like, hey, you got this, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I know that it's possible mm-hmm. that, you know, like I say, recovery is not only possible, it's probable. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I've heard other people say recovery is inevitable mm-hmm. and I don't necessarily believe that. And that's just me. I respect the people that say it, but I've worked in systems where people die. And so that is always fresh in my mind that, you know, that's the only thing that's inevitable, mm-hmm. you know, if you can't, you know, mm-hmm. find your way. And if you're knocking on all of these doors asking for help and this door is getting slammed in your face and this mm-hmm. door is showing judgment and this door um, is is making you jump through too many hoops to where you don't want mm-hmm. to do it, you know, all of those things detour you from actually utilizing the services mm-hmm. that our federal government mm-hmm. puts in place mm-hmm. to help mm-hmm. people. Yes. Um, and forget running up and knocking on the doors, but where's the community outreach? Right. Yeah, Why, totally. Where right. is the outreach? Mm-hmm. Why do totally. people, One people step in better. need, I know, have to come knocking on your door asking for services? Totally. Um, well, and, yeah. and supports, available. right? Yeah. Like um, even in, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that there's there's different models out there that are that are helpful for people. And one of those models for me was the 12 step model. And, um, and I was told, you know, the first 13 years of my recovery journey that this was the way this was work the steps or die motherfucker is what was said to me yeah. like it bluntly. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Whoa, okay. You know, that with treatment, you know, a two years of treatment, um, six months inpatients, um, a year and a half out and then, um, lots of supports. But what happened was later I learned about, uh, Dr. Gabor Marte came to Oregon mm-hmm. and talked about addiction in a whole different way. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. Right. Like my mind was blown. I'm like, you're right. You're right. You know, and I'm standing up. You mean to tell me that somebody with a meth addiction could be a social drinker? And he was like, well, yeah, everybody on the planet has one form or another of addiction. It's whether or not it gets and interferes with their with quality life. of life. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that is not what I've been told the last 13 <laughs> years. So and then it was when my brother came here from prison, I negotiated with California State Parole to get him um, transferred to Oregon after 10 years of being incarcerated. And that was a year and a half process. It was like they put every barrier in front of me. But then when he finally got here, I'm like, we got to go to the, we got to go to the meetings. We got to go to this 12 step. And he's like, I don't want to go to that fucking thing. Like (laughs) every time I go, I want to use, and I haven't thought about using in 10 years. I've been in prison in a fire camp. And I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to be a come a heavy equipment operator, right? And I was like, but you, this worked for me. It's going to work for you. Work the steps or die, motherfucker. And right. he's like, I'm not doing it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's figure it out, right? And so that that's what I'm saying. You're in recovery when you say you're in recovery. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was like this whole new understanding of what that really meant for my own journey, which has cut me off a of meth or, you know, massive drugs for 25 mm-hmm. years. Like, yeah. I mean, how do we, 
how do we like honor people's journey? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like mm -hmm. these rooms were pushing people out because they didn't fit in this click and, 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 or they didn't fit this model. And then a lot of shame was happening mm -hmm. and, and that's not okay. Um, you know, honor, like harm reduction models, honor, whatever. I'm going to stop so mm -hmm. you can add if you'd like, but I just get all fired up about that. Yeah. 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 I like it. Absolutely. Yeah, we need that fiery spirit. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, it's yeah, we like, do. well, to hear it. even yeah, it's still going on, you know, I mean, it's still happening. Um, yeah, this vicarious trauma mm -hmm. for people who we say we are, we're going to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're and going to hospitals. respect you. Yeah. And the hospitals, emergency yeah. rooms, mm -hmm. left left my last job because mm -hmm. I was so burnt out. I started having those seizures. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. I was I having remember. seizures. And I'm like, what it the hell scary. is going on? Like mm -hmm. full-blown seizures. And I went into an emergency room and they uh, told me I was faking it in my chart. I read the chart note, said um, this is... It, this is not a seizure. You're not pooping on yourself is what the uh, ER doctor said. And um, and then I read my chart note. It said purposeful. And I'm like, what? and they pushed me out of that ER room in five minutes. They had me discharged and I was having seizures in the parking lot and they still kept me out. And the I'm next so sorry doctor, you had that experience. this was a year yeah, ago. I'm so sorry like, you had that experience. Oh my gosh. Like yeah, we got to do something different. Terrible. Yeah, we do. We do. Well, Back to the broken system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back to the broken system. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. is a system of poor health mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and vicarious trauma, mm -hmm. secondary yeah. trauma. Totally. Mind you, I have not had one since I left all that stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Walked away from my job, didn't know what the hell I was going to do. Mm -hmm. But it was still less stress than, it, you know, all of the things yeah. that were happening and yes. have not had. So, yeah, were they grandma? No. Mm -hmm. What they were were pseudo seizures, yeah. which was from stress, stress related. Stress related. Stress -related. -related. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Nobody tells you those things. Yeah. Absolutely. They just want to shame you and tell you you're, you're – they thought I had mental health conditions mm -hmm. and that makes it even worse because they thought I was delusional. Mm -hmm. And the reality was um, they treated me horribly because they thought I was mentally ill. So I made a point to let the doctor know the next follow-up and he straightened up. Why? Because I wore professional attire. Mm -hmm. I was showered. I was clean. I wasn't as stressed and I was candid. Articulate. And I was very articulate and said, look, I'm not looking for a diagnosis. I have a job that requires me to drive. I don't want um, a seizure diagnosis, you know, yeah, totally. or epilepsy uh, mm -hmm. diagnosis. And he looked at me and I go, I know what it says in the chart. I read them the moment I left the hospital. I mm -hmm. said, I need you to figure out what's going on. And he ordered all of the tests that I needed. Wow. Why didn't she do that mm -hmm. yeah. in the ER? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yes. We need you to we be know, the boss. We know that. Well, we know that the emergency department is a very difficult place to get good care. Mm -hmm. I mean. I sat on committees for this uh, hospital I, system. Yeah. For very trauma difficult. informed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. yeah. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a broken system. And really, um, I say if you're not, once they figure out you're not dying, they lose interest very mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, that's no excuse. Mm -mm. Yeah. That's no excuse. Mm -mm. Um, yeah. No, mm -hmm. nobody deserves to be treated that way when they're afraid, they're fearful of their life. That's the reason people go to the emergency department mm -hmm. most often. Mm -hmm. And for the, sometimes the physician doesn't even circle back into the room to say, oh, you're not dying and you're going to be okay. They just mm -hmm. have somebody on the staff discharge you. Absolutely. Which, um, yeah, it's unfortunate because it's, there's a teachable moment there. Teachable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I know we're the um, initial chain of, you know, how you play the telephone game, you know, <laughs> the telephone game. It all started in the ambulance because I had a meeting with Dr. Um, not Dr. I had a meeting with um, Senator Ron Wyden and some other people in our, you know, group of uh, community advocates. And I was in the um, ambulance at um, about 15 minutes before our meeting was supposed to hit. And I'm like, oh shit. And he goes, and the, the EMT, bless his heart, but here's where the, the telephone game started. I was in very cut off shorts, tattoos, my hair was all greasy, the whole bit, seizures, whatever. And, um, and then I said, he says, what's wrong? And I said, 
oh, I have a meeting I'm supposed to be at in 15 minutes. And he goes, oh, yeah, what meeting's that? I said, oh, there's a group of us meeting with Senator Ron Wyden. And um, he goes, oh, yeah, what do you do? And so I proceeded to tell him what I do. And I was dismissed ever since. And I know that that passed to the the ER doctor or to the nurse and then to the doctor. I know it did um, just because of the whole energy and how I was treated after that. And Mm -hmm. they thought I was just probably houseless or whatever judgment that they had from the way I looked and um, And and what I was saying. And we were meeting with the senator. And we were meeting with that senator (laughs) and I was pissed that I was missing it. (laughs) So yeah, like, so that, that telephone, you know, and people's perspectives and worldview is shaped. And so I don't want to shame Mm -mm. them. Um, I want to change how they learn to be with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, because we've worked in these systems, you know, we know amazing providers. That's how we met Christine, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, that in itself just gives me all the more reason because, you know, when I'm working with someone and they say that they went into the ER or, you know, they went into a behavioral health provider and they've been treated well, like, I love marketing, right? Yeah. Like that's the best marketing ever. <laughs> Word of mouth, man. If somebody yes. walks out of your services and they're like, oh my gosh, they were so great. They got me in on time. It was so easy. You know, they helped me fill out my paperwork. People will come out and they will say that and they yeah. will tell everybody. That's mm-hmm. true. You know, true. so it's mm-hmm. super important you know, that we are able to implement services that are effective, that work, you know, not only for the people that we serve, not Mm -hmm. only for people like us, you know, who have mental health stuff and, you know, have trauma pasts, but also for these providers. Mm -hmm. And that's one Mm -hmm. of the things that I like to say to providers when we're going in and we're doing consulting Mm -hmm. and technical assistance Mm -hmm. is, you know, I break it down like that. Like when you're delivering a good product, people are going to tell people about that good product. Um, Not to mention the fact that the people coming in who are doing surveys and Mm -hmm. who are, you know, assessing your outcomes, those outcomes mean a lot as well. So Mm -hmm. it's good for everybody Mm -hmm. involved, you know, when you're working in a way that provides the services that people need Mm -hmm. instead of shaming them Mm -hmm. away from those services and scaring them off, you know, essentially. And I think in the future we'll talk about, um, you know, systemically and what drives the funding, drives the services, right? Absolutely. And I'm noticing we have a just a couple more minutes. Um, so um, if y'all see the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe I'll just give a quick blurb of the importance of self-awareness and yes. then we'll um, do a call to action. Perfect. Does that sound all right? Yes, that sounds great. So um, what we hope listeners will really get from some of this is um, really honoring radical self-awareness um, because we're we're taught to be listeners and think that eye contact means, you know, we're listening or this, that, and the other. And what, how do we listen to people or how do we engage with people? Well, um, the key is self-awareness, recognizing when we're connected, recognizing when we're hearing Charlie Brown's teacher, because we quit listening, womp, 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 right? And then, and then, and, and our impact. And then, you know, recognizing how to reconnect, um, or how to be with in the moment with people. Um, it requires us to be aware of our part. Um, so, so there's a lot more to going deep into self-awareness, um, but what we hope over time is that you'll start to kind of do some self-reflection of your part and going deeply into awareness of self, so therefore you can be aware uh, with others. Um, I'm going to read the call to action. Um, so call to action, y'all. Call to action. Yes, I'm wearing glasses. <laughs> Call to action. Um, are you. you with us? Make you make you feel comfortable. <laughs> are you with us? Are you aware? Um, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. I always say LinkedIn. LinkedIn. It's LinkedIn, um, <laughs> YouTube, and our next week's topic. Um, my this is a trauma warning or language warning. I just want to just be very uh, trauma aware and demonstrate what we're talking about. So a little language warning. Um, next week we're going to be talking about um, people are dying because our system is broken, and that's real talk with aware. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, ladies. Bye.